Yo, greetings from quarantine. <laughs> I'm a little bit jet lagged, but it is time for the Attack on Titan Q&A. There are a lot of questions. So let's begin. Ridwan Afwan Karim Fauzi asks, are you going to watch Attack on Titan in nine minutes? Yes, that should come as a bonus video very, very soon. Hopefully this week. Array Yukamasi asks, do you think Eren is truly acting of his own will? Do you think he's being controlled? So yes and no. Like, first of all, there's a problem with me attempting to answer this without having seen the rest of the show or reading the manga, right? Like, there's a lot that I, I still don't know in classic Attack on Titan fashion. And it's possible that Eren is not as in control of himself as he thinks he is. And we we know that there are all these influences he has from people he's eaten, you know, like Grisha and people that Grisha ate, etc. That being said, you know, there's a parable for that in real life as well, which is that we are all sort of the result of things that came before us. We're not born into a vacuum as, you know, perfect craftable human beings. We come with a lot of baggage and that baggage is our just our genetics and then also the environment we grow up in and the messages we internalize from you know authority figures or people around us or from our community or whatever. As a young person your goal primarily the way we're wired is just for survival and what matters most for survival is fitting in harmoniously to our environment and so anything that happens around us any behavior we see we're paying attention to that and we internalize it and we adapt our own behavior to best fit that that world. And when things go wrong, that creates fear and tension and we alter our behavior to keep ourselves in line with what we feel is our own survival. And when things go well, we like double down on it. See Gabby, for example. And it's very difficult to get one layer above that and have some kind of objective view on why we are the way we are or why we're behaving the way we are. And then to make fully conscious choices that are of our own volition. A lot of what we do, even though we don't like to admit it or don't accept it, is us being on autopilot. And the question is sort of like, not if that's the case, but to what degree is that the case? Nevertheless, I personally believe one always has a choice in anything. Often the choices are difficult or seem nearly impossible, or it might seem like there is no choice when certain choices are unacceptable to us. Nevertheless, the final moment of each action comes down to what we do. And I believe that although Aaron has all these past influences, just like we have all these past influences, he still gets to decide what he's doing moment to moment. If that's not the case, then he's not a human being. Or there's some kind of magic that just does not have a parallel in, in real humanity. But I think the show's too clever for that. I think that it does really explore these questions of choice and self-control and freedom and things like that. And so I think that Aaron, though he may not be fully conscious of the choice or accepting of the choice, has a choice in everything he does. Joe Martin asks, have any of these shows inspired you to write your own fictional story? I actually wrote a novel a long time ago, way before the reaction series, but it's terrible. It's really bad. No one shall ever see it. And how do you think the show will be resolved? This is, this is a difficult question. I really don't have a clear picture of it, but just to put forth an answer, I think Aaron is on a path down <laughs> and he's going to keep going down and it's going to destroy him. And I think that eventually the world or maybe certain individuals will rise up and put a stop to him, realizing they've let it go too far. Right now, I think the characters I'm rooting for most are characters who are hesitant because of actually good qualities. You know, they're really considerate and they're thinking about what would be the best thing and they don't want to make the wrong choice and they don't want to be evil. But I think the farther Aaron goes, the clearer of a choice that becomes for them. And he's definitely going, you know, like he's going, going all the way down. So it's only a matter of time before he becomes the enemy of the world. So I don't think he makes it. I think he's on a similar trajectory to Light in Death Note, being a cautionary tale of someone who is not a bad kid, who had so much potential, who had so many great qualities, but was not able to harmonize those things with the world and lost control based on their powers. That being said, I feel like there's a potential for the show to end on a positive note. And I think this has sort of been previewed by definitely Erwin Smith, Sasha's father, and even Aaron himself in conversations with Armin, you know, where they look to the little children and they see that things are bad, right? Things are, are terrible and you just do your best, but you hope that you honor the legacy of past generations by making things better for future generations. That's come up again and again and again. And so I think that that probably is going to be a part of the show. Like it might end in a very bleak way, but there will be hope, you know, and that hope will come from the few, the few heroic people who actually take the burdens onto their shoulders and do their best not to succumb to the, you know, the darkness that certainly everyone can see. And in fact, I think that would be a satisfying and good parable for life because let's not shy away from the darkness, right? Let's not shy away from the tragedy. That's, that's a thing. 100% that's a thing. And it's probably more of a thing than I'll ever understand, hopefully. But I think that it could be so much worse. And the reason why it's not worse is because of the few people who refuse. You know, the few people who refuse to give in to their most evil urges. Bizarrely, I find myself optimistic about the ending in certain ways. There will 
absolutely be <laughs> tragedy in its way as well. But who knows? We'll see. Nick asks, how do you feel about season one and season two now in retrospect, having finished the later parts? I was thinking about this. I, season three and season four, they knocked it out of the ballpark. Like, season three and four are just on a totally different level in my mind than seasons one, or, one and two. The earlier seasons are great. You know, they're a lot of fun. They don't have the complexity for me that the later seasons do. The later seasons are so rich. They're just so rich with, like, character stuff and tense philosophical drama, you know? Season four was is such a trip. It's been the most active, I think, in terms of discussion and commenting and back and forth conversations about all these themes and, and character choices. That's good stuff, you know? That's what I live for. And then season three, I'd say, was more focused on just, like, the actual plot. But what's more important to me is there is so much character stuff in season three. My favorite episode still, to this day, is the Irwin Smith final charge. Just because it, it made certain things so clear to me. Like, the fact that you can lose and still win. You know, Irwin is one of the few winners of the show because he had a complete arc. He had something like an enlightenment arc, where he was tied to the world, but it didn't break him. Like, he died the most ultimate Irwin Smith he could possibly be. He lost, but then you gotta ask yourself, then how did he win? Why does Irwin's final charge and final moments feel like a, a victory, even though Zeke survived? Even though all the scouts got wiped out? He never got to learn the truth. Yet, he's one of the only characters who achieved what he wanted. Aaron hasn't. You know, Aaron, for all this talk about freedom, does not seem very free to me. In fact, I just answer the question, is he even in control? Because it, it seems like he's not, right? He's possessed. And then Levi's interaction with Erwin, the cadets struggling with, you know, fighting their their peers. Reiner and Bertholdt, it's just A-plus stuff. So season one and two are sort of like, they kind of faded into, into memory during season three and four. And specifically to your question about Hanji, she was one of the characters that grew the most in my mind from beginning to end. I thought she was just sort of like this weird, quirky character, but by the end, I, I really adored her. And I think a major turning point for that was her hugging Mikasa during the difficult choice they made. Great stuff. And then, of course, her, you know, her dilemmas in season four. And what else do you think AOT has given you and made you think about, aside from having this meta realization and looking at humanity under a deeper lens? <laughs> I mean, this could be an hour video. There's a lot. But one thing that made me think about a lot that is, I think, important is this idea that the ends justify the means thinking is way more prevalent than I thought. And relatedly, seeing atrocious actions as justified when one feels threatened or attacked is also more prevalent than I thought. It just seems like the pathways to doing bad things are too easy. Considerations of ethics and morality are are suspended a little bit too easily. Which is good, actually. You know, that's part of what's made this so fun, is getting to discuss that. If that's where things are, then that's the things we should be talking about. And so that's part of what, what makes the show beautiful, is it really captures that the challenge. I think that if you're aiming for something good, if you're aiming to be a good person, or you're aiming to find something higher in life that you're connected to, the values you set for yourself, the goals that you set for yourself, can't only apply when things are easy. If they only work when things are easy, it means they don't work, you know, because things are often not easy. So things that are strong, you know, codes that are strong, they don't break down when there's a threat. In fact, that's probably when they're the most important. The thing is, adhering to a set of principles like that is very difficult. And so it's really easy to find ways to make excuses. It's easy to put things in binary choices. Like in a lot of the discussions I've had about the show, often I'm presented with a binary choice and I'm often unsatisfied with that binary choice because to me, it's not binary. To me, that's sort of like a convenient way to get to the side that has already been decided on. Another thing that I've talked a lot about, I think, but haven't really gone into that much detail about is the idea of unintended consequences. I think one of the big assumptions about choice in the show is that there's a linear path pathway from choice to desired effect. But like, just look at our own lives. When does that happen? You know, that never, that's just not how it works if things are complicated. If you give it enough time and enough variables, it will never be what you think it is. In fact, often your best attempts to do something to grab at the immediate solution at the cost of other important things ends up harming you. Like almost always, at least in my experience. People want to talk about changing the world and all these grand things and here's how we fix this, here's how we, how we solve that problem. And they can't even manage the details, the own micro details of their own lives. You know what I'm saying? So how do we expect to have these linear pathways to paradise, you know, to this perfect situation through engineering large groups of people or through large military victories or whatever it is? And with that said, isn't it then less worthwhile to do terrible things towards those stated goals if we're not even sure those goals are going to come to be. And to make things even more complicated, even if you achieve that goal and get what you want, who knows what happens next, right? Like it could melt down in a worse way. So I think while it may sound like I'm being idealist, I actually think this is the most pragmatic solution is to be more nuanced in thought about ca cause and effect and not to overestimate our own abilities to like dictate how the world goes. And there's a ton of precedent for this in history. You know, some of the greatest atrocities that have ever happened in in human history were not necessarily even done out of malice they were done out of like bad planning it's great i love any chance i get to sort of try to add nuance to thinking 
And the show is very nuanced, while some of the characters maybe aren't. And that's sort of the, the fun of it. It's led me to really, like, think about that a lot more more deeply. I'm still thinking about it. Sheriff asks, do you forgive the trio, Bertholdt, Reiner, and Annie? To give a very basic answer, I would say yes. I think what they did is unforgivable. The action itself. That being said, I have a lot of sympathy for them. I understand them. And I think given the fact that a lot of time has passed, depending on what they do next, I'm rooting for them. The three of them, well, Bertholdt's dead, so... <laughs> But Reiner and Annie, they're going to suffer about what they've done forever, like for the rest of their lives. Now they're aware of it. They're never going to unsee Marcel. And I guess my predominant feeling about them, the two of them, is that they can go on to do good. You know, it would be a waste to condemn them and say, like, you know, off with their heads or whatever. It would be better if they took that and, and became forces for good. That's what I like to see. It's satisfying in stories, but also because that's sort of what I, I want to believe. You know, I think that's a good way of living and seeing others like i've never done anything like they've done thankfully but i definitely want to be understood and maybe not forgiven but like allowed to live despite my greatest failings and so i extend that to characters as well and to other people to the best of my ability i think to condemn someone outright forever it doesn't adequately account for time and it doesn't adequately account for change and both of those things are, are very important if they never change their behavior if they were never repentant if they learn nothing then no. But I think it's clear that they, they're still growing. And how do you think Mappa did compare to Wit? So, <laughs> I don't even know which one's which, which is probably an answer in itself. Mappa's the second one, I think, right? I don't know. I got a lot of questions about season four's animation. I thought it was great. I didn't think anything more or less of it. I don't really have the eye for detail about those things. So I think they both did a great job. Though if it gets into matters of storytelling, I think season four is so tight. I can imagine maybe if they had done the entire season, certain things would have been better. But really, I don't have a strong feeling one way or the other. And what's your favorite season? It's so tough, you know? I think season four overall is more solid. But season three has my favorite moments. Especially Erwin's final charge and Levi's attack and the difficult choice and the fight with Bertholdt and all this stuff. Those are sort of peak moments for me in my mind. But season four, it's like every episode delivered something interesting, thematically interesting. Sergio Fiello asks, potatoes, meat, or melon? Pick one. Can I do marry, kiss, kill? <laughs> marry, meat, kiss, melon, kill potatoes. How about that? Minimoni asks, Irwin or Irwin? This is this is a very good question. My answer is Irwin Smith. <laughs> Single-handedly, with the help of a number of scouts, defeating the greatest military on the face of the earth. Dennis Anime Fan asks, how do you feel having gotten cliffhangered for half a year? Are you planning a rewatch? It hurts. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. I got so spoiled having, you know, getting to watch episode after episode, but at least it's just half a year. I, you know, I've heard horror stories of in the past, the gap between seasons being much longer. So count your blessings, I guess. I do definitely need to rewatch the show before part two comes out. And I've gotten some requests to do a rewatch of the show, but we'll have to see. We'll have to see. One way or the other, I'm watching it for sure, because I know even just given the limited amount of things I've gone back to see, how many details are, are sprinkled in. Peter Colon asks, to what extent do a person's intentions matter? Should actions be judged separately from intention? So I think intention is very, very important, but I would also add to intention, knowledge or anticipation of result. So like to sort of the lowest point, right? The worst point, you have bad intentions and you know that there will be a bad result and then you commit the action. That's the worst. Slightly up from that is you have a good intention. You think this thing will end with good consequences, but you know it will have bad results and you do it. That to me is still wrong because you've done something wrong to get to a, a supposed something good but the the wrong is real and the supposed good is less real yet then i think where you start to enter like innocent category is you have good intentions and have no clue about the fact that this is going to cause harm a very stupid example but one that i think illustrates it is imagine you're just walking down the street and you see a couch someone threw out on the on the street and you decide to take it home but you don't realize that it's actually not thrown out people are just transporting it you've just committed a theft but because you really believe that it was discarded and you didn't think anybody would be harmed by you taking it. Something bad happened, right? There's a bad action there. But I don't think that necessarily ref reflects the person's character. Optimally, it's like you have good intentions and you don't do anything you know is wrong in order to get those intentions. I don't know how good of an answer that is. It's it's complicated. I know I'm going to think of a thousand other ways to answer this question later, but that's just my, my crack at it. Keegan Brockage asks, let's say Armin is visited by the lion turtle. I like how it's Armin. And is granted the ability to create a perfect, peaceful resolution. Do you think that would be a satisfying ending to the show? Not in this case, because I think that the question posed for a lot of the show is, do you know who the real enemy is? And I think 
I'm, I'm growing increasingly convinced the answer is us. The enemy is us. And so it wouldn't be as satisfying, I think, for like one character to unilaterally make that decision for everyone. It worked better in Avatar because he's the Avatar who, whose job is to bring peace and balance to the world. And everyone sort of like confers him that responsibility. That's not the case in Attack on Titan. An alternative to that maybe that's somewhere along those lines, but more satisfying to me is that there are individuals that actually are are not guaranteed any way to make a perfect or peaceful resolution, but they do their best to that anyway. And you hope that that is the light in the darkness, so to speak, that makes it more possible for other people to be the same. That to me would be more satisfying. And also I think in line with the way the show's developed some of these ideas. Megan Teleber asks, I would love to know your favorite character pair, romantic or platonic, favorite character trio, and saddest character's death. Okay, favorite character pair, Erwin Levi. 100%. Not romantic, though. The two of them are just so, so perfect together in, in just every way. That final conversation between them is something I will never, never forget. Favorite romantic pair? Let's go with Sasha and Nico. The relationship we got after one of the characters was dead. Favorite character trio? Hard not to go with Mikasa, Armin, Eren, just because there's so, so much that happens surrounding them. And saddest character's death? For me, definitely the Marcel reveal. That one was a, a major gut punch. Khalid Stark asks, what do you think about Theo McGath? He grew on me a lot. You know, initially I sort of wrote him off as this minor character. Oh, he's whatever, just generic commander number two. But he actually has a lot of heart. Like he cares about the kids and he became kind of important, right? Like he's part of the, the counterattack by the warriors. Attack on Titan is very interesting in its ensemble cast because it does a great job developing all these characters. Like there's a huge cast, but it does it in a very subtle and understated way. And you have to kind of think about it to appreciate them. It's not all in your face. Even the principal characters are subtle and understated a lot of the time. It took me a while to realize that Levi was a softy. It's easy to make the mistake of looking at a character and seeing only the tropes that you expect. But Levi is a great example of someone who subverts expectations because he's such a badass, but also he's such a nice person person and he suffers you know he suffers deeply he just doesn't show it Hannah asks what is one aspect of the story you think will stick with you the longest and why Erwin's final charge <laughs> Erwin sort of proved to me an idea that I I had and, and maybe wanted to have which is that you are only free and perfect when you are who you want to be and who you are no matter what the circumstances are Erwin in his final episode even if just for a moment connected to like I don't know what it was something something special something above it the beauty the beauty of the world, where he was just acting as like the best Erwin. And it didn't matter. It didn't matter that he was facing death. It didn't matter that he never got what he what he wanted or what he said he wanted. The universe gave him all this crap and through his entire life, he rose to the occasion, met it head on without flinching and without complaining. That was part of his arc too that I think is, is very subtly done. It shows you that in the past he was complaining and trying to get everyone else on his side through like oration. And eventually he was just like, I guess it's on me. And he, he just got it together he became the leader of the scouts and then he just did his best day by day and like crushed it, you know? And what did he get for that in return? Briefly some accolades, I suppose, which led to that really awkward Erwin smile, which is um, an aspect of the story that I would like to forget. <laughs> but no, what he got was he got himself. He got connection to something like divine purpose, even though that might sound ridiculous. Even the terribleness of Attack on Titan couldn't break him and he died a hero. So for me, that is just endlessly inspiring and just huge. What more do you want to aspire to than Erwin Smith? And it's such a great contrast too in relation to other parts of the show where everyone's like, well, I had no choice, you know, like, what am I supposed to do? Everyone hates me. No, you don't complain. You don't make excuses. You just do your best. And if you die, you die. You know, that is strength. That's something no one can ever take away from you. No circumstance can ever take away from you. Your self-respect and your choices, your decision to be who you want to be in every moment, in every situation, even if it kills you. And that's what makes you memorable. You know, that's what makes you something special. It's not the other things. It's not everyone trying to win a war and, you know, what's the best plan of attack? And no, it's, it's, it's none of that. It's Erwin Smith being great. Khalid Stark asks top 10 or 5 characters. Oh no. Erwin Smith. Erwin Smith. No, I'm kidding. Um, besides Erwin Smith, in no particular order, Levi, Hanji, Connie, Sasha's dad, Falco, Reiner. And I think they all have something in common. What they have in common is, at least at a certain point in the story, they're reflecting and trying to get out of the cycle. They're trying to break it. They have principles that they lean on in, in bad moments. Well, I guess every character has principles, but these characters have principles I like. I like Levi's commitment to his comrades. I like the fact that he hates killing. I like the fact that he's he shows kindness and empathy for others. Same thing with Connie. I like his camaraderie. I like his kindness. Sasha's dad, it goes without saying, he's the man. Hanji for her intellect, for her bravery, and for her... her heart and reasonability. Falco for just being like the best, sweetest kid of all time. Reiner for his ability to reflect and 
focus his energies not on himself anymore, but on helping the kids. That I think is admirable. Maya Brodsky asks, what do you think are Isayama's most prominent lessons or messages by this point in the story? Cruelty is real, terrible things happen, humanity has the capacity to sink really, really deeply into the abyss, but that's not the final assessment and there is beauty in the world. Crazy crap happens all the time and you just do your best to adjust to it. Everyone is a child, meaning everyone is a human being and everyone is sort of part of a cycle, you know, part of a cycle of pain. The only way out of that, the only way to improve the situation is to try to figure out what's the truth for yourself and break the cycle. The more aware you are of where you are in that, the more aware you become of the fact that you're sort of just perpetuating the mistakes of others again and again and again. And by doing bad things, contributing to the negative experiences of others who in turn do bad things, etc., you can then halt that. You can decide to be the change you want to see, as they say. You know what would be an alternative question to this, which I also feel would be interesting, is what are the lessons that everyone seems to take away from the show that Isayama is not saying? So here are some things I see commonly said about themes of the show that I, I disagree with. Right or wrong is determined not by examination of the idea or action, but by your own perspective. If you believe something to be right, then you are right. Relatedly, there are no true heroes or villains. That's not it either. Or maybe more accurately, there are no heroic or villainous actions. I think there clearly are. Choice only exists when you're not under duress. If you're under duress or threatened, choice no longer is a thing. Life is all suffering and anybody who believes otherwise is delusional. That's not the point either. That's part of it. what's so interesting about the show is I feel like there's so many misreadings of it, which plays into a point of the show, fascinatingly, which is that people will fall into binary categories or camps really quickly, often to match their own pre-existing feelings, often based on where they've been placed. Benja asks, you've gone into this before, but why did the season three part one opening Red Swan hold such a steady place in your mind? I think that that opening so beautifully enhanced the entire season because the season is seeing people as human beings and reflecting on where they started and where they ended up. The beauty of the music, first of all, combined with the images of them as little kids, you're like, oh yeah, these are human beings, you know, which is obvious, but it really resonated with me in an emotional way. Like who they are now as a, a, adults is not a different category from who they are as, as children. It's exactly the same. There's a clear line between those things are the same person. They're following the same railroad track, just like all of us are. And that ties into other themes of the show about cycles and actions. And who do you want to be in that cycle? How conscious are you of that cycle? How much can you rise above it? How much can you defy the odds you were given? The fact that everybody is flawed, everyone on some level can be understood or sympathized with, even people who've done the most horrible things. There was something so illuminating about it, and I feel like it, it just matched the season so well. Pierce asks, what do you think Erwin would think of Eren? I think Erwin would be doing his thing of like taking it one step at a time, you know, watching and waiting. I don't think he would overtly ally with Eren. I don't think he would lend himself to like the massacre that we saw. And I think he would be working on contingencies. I think he would be doing things behind the scenes to prepare for multiple possibilities. And he would just be hoping for the best, like always gambling, as he put it. Eric M. Dierman asks thoughts on Berto Holdo Tozu. Yeah, <laughs> Berto to Holdo to. Sweet kid, sweet kid. <laughs> Sad. I felt so bad in the episode where he died because I'm, I got too wrapped up in the choices. Again, like, you know, looking at only the, the binary choice in front of you, missing the, the other option. Bertolt was just a tool for that whole thing. And I felt so bad not picking up on that and just saying like, oh yeah, Bertolt, you know, his death is an inevitability. Bertolt might've deserved consideration in that. You know, he might've deserved the consideration of being the third choice, not that it wasn't already difficult. Burton asks, what are your thoughts on Aaron's dream from the very first episode? I honestly, I don't remember it because, it, you know, none of the things would have meant anything to me at that time. This is why I need to go back and rewatch the show. Camden asks, what do you think would have changed or been different if Erwin was chosen for the Colossal Titan? Man, I really w wish I could have seen this just for, just for the fun of it. All war ends. You know what? It's kind of tough because I feel like him being the Colossal Titan forces you to have a choice between him being the Colossal Titan or him being the commander. And so it's potentially a loss. It works for him as a threat. At least he doesn't have to worry about attempts on his own life as much anymore, or I guess he would, right? Maybe you have to worry about it more. I guess for me, I don't really think it's him having been the Colossal Titan that would have made a big difference, but more like him just being alive that would have made the big difference. And that difference would have been probably just more decisive leadership and a better symbol. I think if Erwin still exists as a symbol, the scouts don't fall so quickly into like the Jaegerists. I think a lot of times movements like that are most effective when people are the most confused because everyone needs something to believe in. People feel good about giving their faith to someone. You kind of just hope that it's somebody good. And if it's not, people will go any number of ways and often they'll go towards the most confident sounding voice. The Jaegerists certainly provided that in, in season four. Katie Barnes asks, who do you think is gonna die by the end of the show? <laughs> I think Eren is, is a sure thing for death. 
Although I haven't ruled out some kind of like cyclical thing, cycle thing happening. I think Levi dies, unfortunately, just because he's one of the few holdouts for trying to do what is right that is sort of sideless. And this is not the world for that. That's a liability in the time of Attack on Titan and all the different factioning and like the war and stuff like that. Michael Stollard asks, what are some things you don't want to happen at the end of AOT? I don't want Eren to do these terrible things and have like a happy ending. And I would hate that because not only would that make me wrong and I'd have to like make a big concession about how wrong I was, although that would never happen, but I just feel like it would cheapen the story a bit and it would run counter to a lot of the things I think stories have already correctly figured out about, you know, be careful going down the dark path in order to attain something that you want, even if you think that thing is justified. I also hope and expect that not everybody will give in to their worst elements. I think that there have to be beacons of light ultimately at the end. And what has your biggest takeaway been with the show? Bigger picture, it's a renewed focus on myself and who do I want to be? And what actions do I want to take? that independent of circumstance, at least I know who I am and I know that that is value and I can respect myself for making the choices that I, I wanted to make, that I knew I should make, despite the temptations otherwise. And to focus on myself and what I'm doing and not to focus on other people and what they're not doing, you know, because I feel like there's an easy road to go down where I'm suddenly like judgmental of people for not feeling the same way I do or becoming cynical about some of the views I see expressed about the world and cruelty and action and things like that. And instead just try to understand and to see it as an opportunity both for myself to learn and then to have these conversations and approach it with the right spirit. And I think that right spirit is connected to a self spirit, self betterment rather than, you know, trying to change the world rather than trying to like convince people. It's, it's more of just like staying open, staying fluid, staying humble and practicing what I preach and being good without having expectations that others agree with me or do the same thing. It's trying to take the maximum amount of power from my life into myself and have the least of it be on circumstance and what other people are doing and just trust that that is my responsibility and that that will lead to good places. Aaron Ong asks, I'm curious about your opinions on Yelena. She terrifies me. Zealotry is not a thing I'm usually going to like. She is a great character, an intriguing character to represent that sort of side of like, I'll do whatever it takes. You know what I mean? So I, I'd say she's a great character, a fascinating character, a very fun character, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust her more than I could throw her. Benjamin Mayhew asks, of all the theories you've had about the show, which ones do you still stand by? Well, I'm pretty sure, I, I think it's been confirmed at this point that Mikasa is the female Titan. So I'm glad to have been right about that one. Then, you know, I threw out a lot of stuff early on. I was just, you know, grasping at straws kind of. One of them was like simulation theory. I was pretty convinced at one point, I think, that the, the island of paradise didn't actually exist in the world, that it was in some weird like bubble or dome or simulation or something like that. But it turned out, no, it's just an island and it's across, you know, across the sea from the mainland. I'm not totally convinced, although you guys can let me know what you think about this, that the author wasn't leaving room for that. It does seem that while a lot of things were, you know, preconceived and planned really well and executed early, there are some sort of larger things that maybe he was not clear on that took shape later, although I could be wrong about that. That's right, I'm blaming the author for my own misunderstandings. <laughs> Aaron asks, do you think Aaron was always destined to turn out a little crazy? Yeah, I think that's the major significance of that early scene, the Mikasa rescue scene. He had a little bit of that in him, right? The That, like, extreme drive, judgmentalness of him being able to decide and him putting people into, into categories of, let's call it, deserving to breathe and not deserving to breathe. So that was there. I'm sort of holding out judgment on this because I feel like there, there there might be something either cyclical about it or time time jump related because we know there's some weird time thing happening. So I don't know. Blood Mist asks, who is best girl? I'll give it to Hanji, actually. Who is best boy? Levi. Connie. Connie is best boy. <laughs> Connie or Levi. Coco X Large asks a question which I will summarize as like, ideals are great, but often holding to your ideals will destroy you. And so what do you do? And who do you side with? So firstly, and this might be too obvious, but just to get out of the way, I would say give up on the notion of sides. Like the sides don't matter. There's a danger to attaching too strongly to any side. It doesn't mean you can't like maneuver in the world and join organizations or whatever, but I think there's an important mental distinction between being for things that are good or, or trying to do good things and being on a side. Those are not the same thing. It's too easy and very obvious to see people get swept up in just their side as like an ideal in itself and become all sorts of terrible things in defense of that. In fact, you often see two sides be way more similar to each other than they realize. They're both doing the same things. They're both commit, they're both, let's say lying, or they're both cherry picking their evidence, or they're both justifying their behavior or pointing fingers and say, well, you did it first. The truth of the matter is most people are very similar. In any group, it's gonna break down into the same thing and the same type of people. Almost exactly. You know, it's going to be a handful of people who really have done the research and understand the issues and have arrived at a certain way of thinking and really are doing their best, you know? Then you have people in the middle, let's say, who like don't really fully understand it at all. And they believe themselves to be doing good things and they have good intentions, but they're they're not fully understanding the complexity of 
the world and the issues. And then there are people at the bottom, which I would say is also a min minority of people who are just opportunists and are using the situation for their own personal advantage and don't give a crap about any of the issues. And every side will be the same. And so it's less about what side you're on, but which of those groups you're in, you know, who are you in that in that breakdown? And if you truly are someone at the top, then you are someone who's willing to move at, at the drop of a dime on new evidence, right? Because you're aligned to not the group, but to like a goal or to just goodness or whatever it is. And secondly, and maybe more importantly, I would say like, you're right, you know, like you can't control the course of history. You will get squashed if people decide to squash you. There's nothing you can do about that. And so you just have to surrender to that. That's just the way life is. And so you focus on what you can change, which is you focus on yourself. Like how many of us are qualified to even know what's good for the world when we can't even run our own lives? Like I was saying earlier, you know, like who are any one of us to think that we are the ones, you know, we are the anointed ones who, if only people would listen to us, you know, if only people would understand our points of view, that everything would be different. Everyone feels that way. So that's clearly not, not a way of measuring yourself. You know, it's not an accurate test of your own value and worth in terms of should you be listened to? Should you have power? So like master yourself first, you know, like get your own life together. And amazingly, if you shift that focus from why is no one understanding this? Look at how many illusions people believe. If only they would listen to me. Two, I'm going to try to be the best person I can be. That actually is the solution. That is the system that when widely applied solves a lot of the issues. But what's required is a certain amount of humility. You know, it's a certain amount of social Soul searching. It's a certain amount of self mastery. It's removing unnecessary cynicism and seeing other people who don't agree as being stupid or naive or whatever. It's an inward journey. The desire to change the world, I feel like there's something noble inside of it, but I feel like there's also something kind of toxic about it, which is maybe a desire to be validated or a desire to be listened to or desire to have power. And I think that the more negative emotion there is wrapped up in these thoughts, the more that is the case. It's one thing to want something it's another thing to like have disdain or disgust for other people for not wanting the same things or not seeing it the same way that's an ego thing that's not not a pure desire and so you do the best that you can and you try to become good at something like try to become good at at one thing locally that you are providing benefit to the world because if everyone did that then the world would be a much better place so in summary i think that the solution is not to win against humanity or something like that but to shift the focus to what one has power over and that is oneself. And I think that that's not idealism, you know, that is the challenge of life, you know, it's it's something so important and it's something that only we can do, but at least it's something we can do. Let the world be what it is and meanwhile, you know, you be a good person and you speak the truth and don't become hateful, don't become overly cynical, don't look to cause harm to others who don't agree with you. Be a virtuous person and live by example and you just trust that that has ripple effects outwards. And maybe that's enough, you know, maybe that's what you have to do, that's the responsibility. That's the challenge. That's one's personal challenge. And I think once you see that, once you know that, it's a call to action. It's something that you can no longer ignore. And to some extent, you know, busying ourselves with like the arguments of the world is kind of missing the point to some extent. Not to say they're not important, but that is sort of an obvious front. And there's an important front that I don't see talked about as much, which is the personal front. Jackass asks, which character do you think will surprise us the most in the next season? I'm hoping Reiner. I'm hoping Reiner comes through and like does great things and like really helps the kids. Maybe Gabby too. I feel like Gabby could turn it around. If the show is going the way I think it is and there's hope for some people, there's hope for some characters, Gabby is the one who sort of has to break the cycle because I think in many ways she's a parallel for Aaron. She's like the next Aaron, you know? Patrick Farr asks, what's the truth? <laughs> I don't think we'll ever know, but maybe that's the point. You you never know the full truth. You never know the full effect of your actions. So you make the best choice you know how to make at any given moment and you see what happens and you just keep living that way. You just do your best. Nicholas Sabato asked me to rank Attack on Titan in terms of these things. Aesthetic art style, nine. Character development and attachment, eight. Storyline in relation to running themes. If we're just going by the maximum, I give it a 10. Music composition and style, genre, 10. Joey Healy asks, do you think Picasso will finally reveal herself as a female Titan? I mean, obviously. I mean, hasn't she already? Marcus Lawyer asks, have you ever read a comment that changed your opinion on something? I think what happens most of the time when I read comments, I mean, it happens every video, really, is it gives me just like a little bit more of a rounded understanding of things. I've definitely come to relate more to Aaron's character over time after reading reading comments. I still maintain, you know, most of my ideas about like morality and not falling into ends justify the means, etc but the comments often help me have sympathy. A lot of times that happens when I have a very strong reaction to something. Comments will sometimes pull me back to a more, you know, reasonable position, which is good. I really appreciate that. Comments also have helped me appreciate characters that I might have missed otherwise, like Moblet. I don't think I really would have noticed him. 
If it wasn't for like people constantly pointing out how, how great mobile it was to Hanji, which he is. I would also say one interesting thing that happened to me in comments was that when I talk about how great Erwin is and how like, you know, morally righteous he is, a lot of people were pointing out the Stoas incident. And while I maintain that it, it's not as bad as Eren killing civilians just because it wasn't quite his his plan, you know, it's, that all happened because his plan failed to capture any peacefully. I realized I was defending it a little bit too much and that it was a mistake. And that also that doesn't really matter for what I'm saying about his arc. Having a, a perfect arc doesn't mean you're always perfect, if that makes sense. And also what would be the worst ending imaginable? Oh, this is tough. Worst ending imaginable. Rod Race Titan comes back from the dead carrying Zachary's ass chair and makes everyone pay. <laughs> I don't know. Matt Lott, to summarize, asks about moral relativity and what makes human morality special. Speaking of themes that I think a lot of people take from the show that actually are not there is the idea that morality is relative. I don't think the show is saying that and I don't think that that's true. I think it is true that anybody can believe whatever they want, but not all beliefs are created equal or as robust as other beliefs. I think that while it's probably difficult to say that there's like one perfect objective moral code to live by, a lot of people probably would agree with the idea that, well, not all actions are created equally. Like there's shades, there are degrees, and even if you don't have a perfect morality, you have something like a, a ranking or hierarchy of morality and you can aim for the top. And to see morality as something totally abstract and random is to not understand humanity, I feel, and not understand nature. In fact, I think morality is probably very closely linked to survival, which is why we seem to have an intrinsic, intuitive, natural sense for it that we're almost born with. What makes it really complicated though is that there are multiple survival games happening at the same time. One is the individual and one's own survival will make people do all sorts of things in the name of that in that survival and can think about it as moral in terms of their own survival. But there's also the survival of groups and the survivor of societies and the survival of a species. Often what is good for someone individually is terrible when widely applied and ends up having a destructive force on large groups. And because I think that very thing, that very conflict has been played out again and again over tens of thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands or millions of years, there are certain lessons that we've we've learned and have internalized about morality. So it can't be random and arbitrary. To think that any of our thoughts, you know, any of our actions are disconnected totally from society is to have a very strange idea of what human beings are. You know, human beings arose from a system, a system of rules for survival. And so some things just work better than others. Like what doesn't seem to work is indiscriminate killing to take an extreme example. That seems to just destroy potential and also have devastating ripple effects out into time. And then to put an unnecessary spiritual tint to it, seeing it as connected in that way to the natural world means that we are vehicles of the universe. Because the universe seems to have a structure and some things seem to work and some things seem to not work. It's almost like a desire, you know, it's almost like the universe wants. And of course it's not wanting in the way we typically think of it, but if certain pathways lead to continuation and certain pathways lead to the ending of something, doesn't that in some way seem like a preference? You know what I'm saying? So by listening to what we truly are and by doing things that are harmonious with maximizing this potential that we're given and respecting humanity and trying to grow humanity peacefully and not give in to base instincts that end up creating cycl cyclical effects to destroy humanity, aren't we in some way being perfect reflections of something like the universe? That is a very abstract thought and I'm also making a lot of leaps there, but I like to conceptualize it that way because it makes me feel connected to something much richer and much deeper and gives me a sense of like universal responsibility, which makes me feel so connected to my life. So for me to hear like, well, whatever you believe is okay is no, not at all. That is an understandable first step in thought about morality and life, but that's not the end. There are many, many paths above that. So I'm sort of all over the place here, but what I'm trying to do is structure morality to something undeniable. You can argue about what that morality is, but I think it's different from saying that there is no morality or morality is only what you believe. For me, there's a humility lacking there seeing ourselves as like these creatures that were formed outside of the natural world. We're not that special. You know, we're, we're just a part of things. Magus Lawyer asks, do you feel compelled by Aaron as a character while simultaneously disagreeing with him? Or do you dislike him? So it's complicated. I definitely disagree with a lot of his actions, especially recent actions. Um, I think his thought is limited. Dislike him is the wrong word. Well, I wouldn't want to hang out with him as a person. And he kind of gives me the creeps as a human being. I like him as a character. I really like him as a character. And I simultaneously am able to have empathy for him. He's in a position that nobody should find themselves in. And honestly, I don't think he was that bright to begin with. So it's sort of all those things. I, I do think that there are positive qualities as I've spoken about before to him in season four. And I understand why he's appealing. He represents command and mastery over a cruel world. But that I think should be separated from the evil acts that he does. Th those things are great. Those qualities are great, but doesn't make him worth rooting for 
for certain things he's done. And also, would you say you're a little too idealistic? Yeah, you know, probably. I think that's fair. But one thing I would push back on is I don't think there needs to be the separation between idealism and pragmatism. I mean, I think that good idealism is pragmatic. Like an idea has no real value if it's disconnected from the world. It has to be something you want and something you think is great, but then it has to reflect the way things actually are. And so I think that's sort of the connotation of being idealistic where it's a dream that's not feasible. Where I think that my idealism is pragmatic is I think that, yeah, these things are difficult and it's not possible to expect this from the world, but it is possible for you yourself to do it. It is possible for you to make the best choices you know how to make. It is possible for you to try to avoid the evil that you see. And I do think that is in many ways the solution, the, the focus on the individual. And I think the more we prioritize those things, those values over some anticipated effect, and the more people do that, the better things become pragmatically. And one of the things to your question about like, when do you step up and guide people who are lost and confused? I think you just do your best to tell the truth. I don't think it works to see people as like pawns and tools to be manipulated. I think you do the Irwin approach where you just say what it is and you let people make their own choices. And a lot of times people surprise you, you know, the more I think about it, the more I experience and the more I do YouTube, the less cynical I become and the more I... I understand the potential in people and that most people are actually good and well-meaning and want to do the right thing. And so it's not a matter of like seeing these people as dumb or sheep or misguided. The goal is to find understanding. The goal is to express ideas kindly, you know, with warmth. If you're really purely motivated, if you're not able to do that, you're not the one who should be leading. You know what I'm saying? John Carzales asked, did you cry or were close to crying during Sasha's death scene? Not Really, as far as I can remember, I think I did cry during Irwin's death scene because it was so amazing. I don't really cry um, sad tears that much. I cry happy tears. Like, if you look at the Avatar reactions, I cried during the Iroh episode, which is just so beautiful. Although I guess that's sad. That's a sad scene. But I also cried during the zuko Iro reunion, which is a happy scene. That that gets me more. Like, the expressions of pure beauty kind of get to my heart. Siege asks, what do you think about Armin's contribution this season? I was sort of uh, alarmed by his use of the, the powers to, like, annihilate the the fleet. I was speculating early on in the show that Armin might become a villain. I'm really not sure where he's going to go. It does feel like he's taken a little bit more of a backseat than I expected from him becoming like the next Erwin Smith. You know, that's how it was sort of foreshadowed. But I have a feeling some of this is set up. I think Armin has to go, go through certain things and have like that table scene with Aaron, for example, and support him in that battle for him to have a reflection. Although I'm not sure what side he'll fall on. He might still end up becoming villainous. He's always had that streak. You know, he's had that propensity to go with manipulation, which kind of worries me. And can you make a guess on what Aaron wants to achieve with the Founding Titan's power? I don't know specifically, but I feel like it's going to be something like enhancing his own power to make big systemic changes for the world that he thinks will make the world free or will protect the world, which of course will not happen. The world will suffer negative results because of what he's done and he will never be free. That's my guess. Blood Mist asks, do you think it matters which sides of history are correct? Speaking about Marley versus the Restorationists. No, not not really. I think what's more important is what's happening right now. Personally, I feel like this whole, well, you started it thing or remember that evil that you did? You can never live a life. You can never change. You can never be anything better than that. And so you're evil. That thinking kind of bothers me. Corey Price asks, if you could have any Titan power, what would it be? How would you use it? Armor Titan, I think, would fit me. And I'd use it to protect. Cool Kids Boy 134 asks, in what ways do you think the perspective shift in season four changed your opinion about the show? I think it actually validated a lot of the things I was saying about the show. You know, how I refuse to take sides. I refuse to hate Reiner. One thing I think it changed somewhat is it gave me more faith in the show. It gave me more faith in the fact that it wasn't just trying to paint this picture of like, everything sucks. You know, it's definitely not that. Season four has too many examples of people stepping up and being, being better than everyone else. That for me was conclusive proof that Isayama was not saying what people what many people seem to think he's saying about, you know, the cruelty of the world and the nature of life. Blood Mist asks, what do you think is the special way Zeke wipes his ass? <laughs> um, well, it's Attack on Titan, so maybe the twist is he just doesn't wipe his ass at all. Emily Laws asks, who do you feel is the worst written character? I would say up until season four, or up until the OVA maybe, it was Mikasa. She did a lot of Eren, right? And that's about it. Other than that, I would have liked to have seen more for Ymir. I feel like I never really grew to appreciate her character in the way other people seem to. She sort of came and went and then was dead. Ash asks, what are your thoughts on how Eren truly feels about Mikasa and Armin? Well, like Pixis said, the best way to disguise a lie is with the truth, right? And I think that Eren does care about his friends. I just think that he also on some level, is disgusted by them. I think he's disgusted by Mikasa because, you know, it's just natural to be disgusted by people who are throwing themselves after you. It's sort of this sad thing, but it's true. And I think one thing the OVA pointed out is that Mikasa is in some ways the type of person Aaron hates, where they're just concerned with their immediate environment and keeping that safe. When How can you enjoy that when there's just so much freedom to be had or something like that? And I think that he's probably disappointed with Armin because Armin was bound for a crash since he was on this super high pedestal all of Aaron's life. Have you heard about my friend Armin? He's the best, etc. So it's not meaningless. He cares about them, but grain of truth. Grain of truth. Shasha Bizadvi asks, where does Erwin rank on your list of favorite characters across all shows? 
Ooh, he's up there right now. You know, because your feelings change based on recency. He's number one at this moment. Mad C asks, what do you think of Ymir's abandonment of Historia and subsequent death? How do you think that impacted Historia? I actually don't really understand it. I haven't really thought about it. So I'd actually like to ask you guys this. Can you guys let me know what I'm missing from Ymir? Why did she abandon Historia? How do you think that impacted Historia? <laughs> I'm outsourcing my question answering now. The Rock Pharaoh asks, do you think that Instead of the euthanization plan, the Titans could instead be helpful to the world and push towards a wor world free of war and slavery. I think the world will never be free of those things. I think that's sort of the mistake a lot of the characters are making. There's no utopia. You cannot rid the world of suffering. And I think often the attempts to remove suffering from the world counterintuitively create more suffering because what you're doing is you're messing with natural functions. You're messing with a delicate system and things have a way of biting you in the ass when you do that. So I would say it really just comes down to the people and the sides. It doesn't really come down to the tools because there are going to be tools for destruction no matter which way you slice it. If it's not the Titans, it's going to be technology. And so it just matters like how are the people and what is the culture like? Rudy Strother asks, which of the nine Titans is your favorite design? I thought the Warhammer Titan was pretty cool that one time we saw it. <laughs> Gabriel Avalar asks, would you ever consider watching Attack on Titan Junior High? I would, maybe as a, as a Patreon extra. That'd be cool. Oh boy, we got a <laughs> Mary Kiss Kill from Yusuf. This is a lot of them. <laughs> this is going to be like a 30 minute thing. All right. Mary Petra, Kiss Historia, Kill Mikasa. <laughs> Oh no, this is not gonna go well. Marry Peak, kiss Annie, kill Ymir. Marry Erwin, kiss Erwin, kill Armin. <laughs> Marry Bertolt, kiss Reiner, kill Kenny. Kiss Sasha, marry Connie, kill John John. Kill Aaron, kill Flush, kill Zeke. Thank you for understanding me and actually putting a description for who, who Moblet is. I appreciate that, even though I know who he is. Marry Marco, kiss Moblet, kill Marlo. Marry McGath, Kiss Galliard, kill Willie Tiber. Kill Rod Rice, kill Major Gross, kill Darius Zackley. Marry Niccolo for the cooking. Kiss Onyanko Pan, kill Yelena. <laughs> and then finally, marry Pixis. Oh, this is not, not great. Kiss Shadis, kill Magath. I don't know. That was a tough one. That was the hardest hitting question so far. <laughs> You couldn't have given me more more girls on this? Oh, well. Gekshin asks, what would be your plan to save the Eldians? It wouldn't be all that different, honestly, but I think there's just certain lines I wouldn't cross. Like, it's not that I'm a pacifist and don't believe in fighting, but I think you fight to defend yourself. I sort of am disgusted by the idea of preemptive war, and I just don't think that that works. I think it just emboldens the people that you attack. So you fight. You know, you defend yourself. You don't want to be weak. You don't want to let evil destroy the good, but you don't become the evil in the process. So yeah, I would fight them too. I would definitely fight back but I would just be very careful what that looks like. Clement asks, the greatest leader, Erwin Smith, or the almighty and shiny Alex Lewis Armstrong? Speaking of Mary Kiss Kill, that was a missed opportunity for like, you know, cross series things. Joseph Hilson asks, who do you think is the true good guy in the show? I think that the characters who are, let's say heroic or do heroic things are the ones who maintain their their beauty, you know, maintain their virtues, despite all the terrible things they experience. Bubble Tea asks, what are your thoughts on the different ships? Eren Mikasa doesn't really do it for me. Eren Astoria, I feel like there's something there. There's something there. Erwin Levi? No, not really. My favorite ship is definitely Sasha and Niccolo. Armani Levi asks, what do you think about Mikasa's growth? I think that there were moments in the first three seasons that were really good. I really like her reflection on the on the wall, and I really like her OVA. But that being said, I think most of her development for me comes at season four. You know, the fact that she's conflicted about Eren. The fact that I thought it was a long time coming and was glad that there was a payoff for that. I think it would sort of be unsatisfying if she just was what she was in the early seasons the whole time, you know? There's no growth, there's no arc, and it's not a flat arc either because she's starting off in a place that we can all see is limited. She's throwing herself after someone who doesn't fully appreciate her and who is prone to do, you know, questionable things. So I was really grateful and glad to see her like sort of come awake and think about, is this right? Am I doing the right thing? You know, that's exciting to me. As for cliffhangers, I do sort of feel like episode 16 was not the strongest cliffhanger, interestingly. Episode 12 might have made a better cliffhanger, but I feel like at this point it doesn't matter. We're all going to watch we're all going to watch it, right? If we made it this far, there's no way we're not going to watch the next part. So cliffhanger is sort of whatever. Eli Lane asks, who do you think would be most likely to survive in the second part of season four? There's a danger here because it's the end. So you don't need to save characters anymore. I think Gabby survives. And that's my only guess. Because she has to survive to break the cycle. If she dies, that cycle thing is, is lost. And I feel like that's been built. So would they throw it away? Maybe. That would be very, um, very shocking. Avertree asks, what do you think Falco and Gabby's contribution to the plot might be from here? This is a total guess, but as I mentioned, I think that Gabby is a reflection of the cycle, and she's the next iteration of the cycle, and so I think she has to break the cycle, or be sacrificed and the cycle continues, or something like that. Just spitballing here, but Falco dying would be the final straw for Gabby if there was one, because he's the one person she seems to really care about, and so if he died, 
that would potentially set her off and that would create a choice. And I think that what she could do from there is perpetuate the cycle or break the cycle. My hope would be that she breaks it. But I don't know. I mean, really, it could go any any number of ways with them. And also, what questions do you think need to be addressed and what confrontations need to occur in order for things to be wrapped up in a satisfactory way? So I think Reiner and Aaron definitely have to have their battle, which maybe in some ways can be looked at as like, Two battles for people, because I think Aaron is doing what he's doing for, for other people in his head, but both of them having different reasons for doing that, or different motivations. Like, Reiner seems to just want to stop the kids from having to experience this, right? Just save the people that I love in front of me. And Aaron seems to be more like, destroy the people that are a threat so that people I love can live peacefully. And so that's an interesting clash there. Mikasa has to make a choice. I think that's happening. Gabby has to make a choice. That's happening. A lot of choices must be made. Ultimately, I think, or maybe just hope, the way it goes is that at the end of the day, despite what happens, things probably will devolve further into chaos, but there are still people at the end who have not been beaten, who honor the legacy that Erwin described you know, where you take on what the people in the past have given you and you try to pass that on to future generations as best you can. Dennis Anime Fan asks, do you think Levi's dead? And do you think this would be a fitting end to his story? I don't think he's dead. I think he's too important and there are too many things he could be doing later that would be great for for him to die here off screen. I think if he was going to die here, it would have been a very explicit death. I think it's part of the cliffhanger. I think it's possible he confronts Eren. You know, there's been a lot of setup for that. Will Marco asks, thoughts on Flock and his character development from season three to four? I like him as a character. I don't like him as a person. You know what's funny is that I, re I was reading comments about how he's like so cool and so badass now. For me, what it feels like is he's afraid. It feels like he never really processed the experience he had where he, he you know, everyone died except for him. He is just trying to grab onto something that he can believe in and be strong. And so a lot of it seems like a facade. You know, he's like, this fake Erwin, which is really cool. Like it's a really cool way to develop him and feels real to me. So I like him as a character a lot, even though I don't agree with him. And I feel like his progression was very natural. Aaron Sarah asks, thoughts on each of the Marleyan Titan holders? Peak really grew on me in the last episode, as you might imagine. I so detested the Duck Titan for like the role in the, you know, the scout battle in season three, but Peak grew on me. I'm, I've been converted. Galliard seems like a decent person himself. Reiner, obviously I'm a big fan of. Zeke, terrible. Don't like him. The guy doesn't even wipe his ass. Kel Green asks, how do you feel about Eren? He looks dead inside. It's weird seeing a character change so much. Yeah, honestly, from the very beginning, I've been creeped out by Eren. There are moments where I really liked him and I've rooted for him for most of the show, but it has felt like fighting an uphill battle with him because it's one step forward, two steps backwards a lot of the time, or at least like one step forward, one step backwards. And he never really, really seems to have emerged from the depths of his like darkness and despair, even though he flirts with it. You know, he flirts with things that are better, like believing in friends and believing in the future and doing things one step at a time and being humble and not seeing yourself as special. By the end, he sort of leaned into all of those things. You know, he's not relying on his friends. He does see himself as someone who should enact change on the world. And I've seen some conflicting opinions about that because Eren talks about him not being that way. Like he talks about understanding the Marleans, but I feel like that talk is sort of cheap and the actions speak louder than what he's saying. And the actions show me that whatever dialogues he's had with himself, he is operating under the belief that he is the Arbiter and that they do deserve to be wiped out and that his friends don't matter. You know what I mean? Kieran Thresh asks, who's your favorite background character? Thomas. <laughs> Remember Thomas? They were going to have a, a Titan killing contest and that didn't work out very well, did it? I don't know if this counts, but I'll go with... What the hell's her damn name? Marlo's girlfriend. She's cool. She has a lot of personality for someone with limited screen time. Shakira asks, what's your favorite plot twist or re revelation in the story so far? The Reiner twist was was amazing. That was so good. It was so well done. I love how the camera's panning away and how he just so casually drops it. Billy Mons asks, what are some of your favorite comparisons between the show so far and aspects, characters, and Fullmetal Alchemist? It's really great to think about these shows side by side because... As I joked about, right, like they both start sort of down here. They both start in the depths and then Full Metal Alchemist rises out of it. And that's the point, right? The question is, how do you make good of your life despite tragedy, despite the potential for evil that humans have? And Attack on Titan also starts at a much lower point, I'd say, and then it keeps going down and then it keeps going down. But to, you know, add a little epilogue on my joke, I think it's now rising out of it. And I think Full Metal Alchemist has the answer, which is part of what makes that show so satisfying. And that answer is you are not disconnected from the universe or the truth. You are an essential part of it. And that gives you a responsibility to act with a code of honor in accordance with the realities of the world, to sacrifice what you know or what you think you know, to be good, you know, in, in the name of helping others, to have humility, to have understanding, to have compassion. That's what makes Edward Elric so special and his decision at the end so special. And that's contrasted with all these people trying to shape the world and remove evil from the world, right? Just like they're do doing an Attack on Titan, which doesn't work. It makes things worse. But what Brotherhood gets so right is that firstly, it sees everything as connected and as a part of a whole. 
And you combat the tragedy through multiple things. One is through community and through taking care of the world that you you live in, you know, especially the people closest to you. You embody virtues, even if the world expects you not to embody those virtues, even under incredible duress and pressure, you still hold true to your virtues. And those virtues are hopefully in accordance with the truth, with the way things actually are. And you're willing to sacrifice. You're willing to sacrifice yourself. You're willing to sacrifice your beliefs. You know, you're willing to have the humility to not think you know everything. And through that embodiment and through the refusal of committing evil that you don't want to do, you end up creating ripple effects outwards. And it doesn't take that many people to make huge changes. And to me, that feels so right. You know, it's such a correct analysis, I think. So that remains to be seen in Attack on Titan, but I do think it's leading there. I think that there are these holdouts. There are these few holdouts that are struggling right now. They're struggling because they're good, but they're still fighting that fight. And I think that maybe on some very limited level, but on some level, nonetheless, they're going to have a victory. Something good will come of it. It's been foreshadowed already by Erwin's death. The fact that Erwin died right after making that speech about honoring the legacy of the past and carrying things on for the future was his contribution, which then those characters are inspired by and are carrying forth. Puneeth Nikola asks, what do you think of the AOT community and were you spoiled by any chance? It's funny because I got all these warnings before starting about how like there would be all these spoilers and I know there were, but thankfully I was either able to sniff it out myself or people were really good about like writing spoiler on, you know, in the comments and because I read bottom up, I was able to avoid basically all spoilers. And in fact, I think I got more comments warning about spoilers than I got spoiler comments. Now, what I'd like to say is that that's not the AOT community, it's my community, which is awesome. It's literally the best ever. I have been able to have faith that things will work out and they have. As for spoilers, people were like very quick to make fun of me for the Mikasa is the female Titan thing, but jokes on them because she is. And then I think um, one form of spoiler that I got was not an explicit spoiler. It wasn't like this happens at this time. It was more like I would say things and a lot of people would say like, wow, this is such an accurate comment. And it wouldn't clue me in exactly to what was going to happen, but a lot of times it would put me on the right track. Like one thing that I think actually impacted me negatively is that when I first talked about Aaron having some kind of darkness, it became clear to me from comments that like, this is going to come up again. Like his darkness is, is a big thing. And I didn't know how much it would come up again or what it would look like. But sure enough, here we are in season four. Arbit Words asks, what are your thoughts on Niccolo? I really love his role in facilitating that scene, that Gabby scene. He did a lot. I was sort of mad that he knocked out Falco, but he's an interesting character. You know, being this Marleyan captive who ends up understanding the Eldians or the people on Paradise, Paradise, sort of living in this in-between world, knowing about the wine, falling in love with Sasha. He's very, very complicated. Danielle1207 asks, do you think it was right to let Erwin rest when he was at the end of his arc or development? Yes. I think that there's something symbolically important about that. Thinking about things in terms of arcs and what they represent, he already had what I consider to be a perfect arc. He became the maximum Erwin. <laughs> if that makes sense. There was really nothing left for him to do. And I would have been fine if he had survived and, you know, got the truth and all that, because he's a cool character. And, you know, in real life, one arc ends and another one begins. So there would have been plenty of things that he could have done anyway, it would have been compelling as well. But I think in terms of just what he had been so far up to that point and the question of like satisfying his father and finding the truth and leading the scouts and am I a villain? Am I a demon? Whatever. All of that was answered so nicely that to me, his death wasn't a tragedy. It was something to be celebrated. You know, he died as this perfect person. He died as like a realized character, a fully realized character. And that's something that most people never get. And surely characters in the show don't get. And also most underrated character. Have I ever told you about Erwin Smith? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Can you imagine if that was actually my answer? It is though. It is my answer. But I can't just answer Erwin for everything. So to give another answer, I'll say Connie. People sleep on Connie. He's a, he's a good kid. <laughs> Juan Pablo Perez Sanchez, how do you feel about season four Reiner and how that facial hair made him extremely popular on TikTok as a dill? <laughs> I mean, he's a good looking guy, not gonna lie. Red Wolves asks, how much are you looking forward to the second half of season four on a scale of one to 10? 11. <laughs> I'm really sad that the show's ending, to be honest. And also like, I always feel a little bit of anxiety when a series ends. It's like, is this the end of the channel? And it hasn't been so far, but you know, there's always that thought. Archit Gosh asks, Armin has the highest kill count in Attack on Titan. He nuked countless innocent people. Why doesn't he get the hate and criticism that people give other characters like Reiner, Aaron, Zeke? Isn't that hypocritical? I think you're onto something, honestly. I think that what Armin did is terrible and should be held accountable for that. I don't care that he did it in defense of Aaron. I think one reason why people might give him a pass, especially compared to like Aaron and Zeke, is because it's pretty clear to us that he didn't want to do it and that he regretted it. And that doesn't make the action any better, but it does at least suggest that there's a chance he can not do that in the future. I would say the same thing about Reiner. Like the reason why I'm not harder on Reiner is because firstly, what he did was way in the past in his childhood. But secondly, you can see that Reiner has changed. And I would not give that same courtesy to Aaron and Zeke. Like Aaron and Zeke seem to just be 
continually doub doubling down on what they're doing. So that, I think, is an element that gives people hope for Armin and gives me some hope for Armin that, yeah, what he did is up there with, like, really the worst stuff in the show. But looking at Armin, knowing Armin, you just hope that that was it, that from now on he uses his powers for good. Rinray asks, Gabby and Hanji are my favorite characters. Am I valid? Yeah, of course you're valid. Like, I feel anyone should be free to like any characters they want. Daniel 1207, did the basement reveal every question there was, or th is there still a question left that hasn't been answered? Who is the real enemy and why is it the birds? Piali Dasgupta asks, in your opinion, what makes Attack on Titan special than the others? Firstly, I'd say like in that in that exploration of the darkness of humanity versus the light of humanity, Attack on Titan goes further into the darkness than anything I've ever seen. And so it's no small feat that it, it's trying to build out of that now. So I really respect that. I think that's amazing. Then I think the design and the concept around the Titans themselves and the gear, the ODM gear and some of the battles, it's it's so different and special and unique. Then the depths of moral gray that it goes into, I think sets it apart. And then I would say certain characters are, are developed so masterfully and, and subtly. And that's impressive, despite the fact that there are so many characters. There's a negative to that too, though. Sometimes I feel like characters are not given enough time before they're killed off. And so it's sort of like, eh, there goes another one, you know? Issa Faye asks, would you rather eat food in front of Sasha or propose to Eren in front of Mikasa? I would never, under any circumstances, eat food in front of Sasha. <laughs> but does that mean I have to propose to Eren? I mean, I wouldn't propose to Eren, but it's not because of Mikasa. Oh man, that adds a whole new dimension to the question. Oh god, I think I would, I think I just found the circumstance that I would eat food in front of Sasha. It would be to avoid proposing to Eren. And what was your favorite OVA? I think it was Mikasa's OVA, actually. Which is weird, because on paper it doesn't sound like it would be that good. It's sort of a fantasy or dream sequence thing, but it ended up making me really appreciate her character, which I think is great. And I think also set me up really well for season four. Mikasa's conflict in that season make a lot more sense, I think, having seen the OVA. And do you have any hope for Aaron? I always have hope for people. I, I really would love him to turn things around. But I just think, like, from what has been built narratively, I think he's just on a path. He's on a course. And so it's difficult for me to imagine him turning that around. The deeper you go, the harder it is to turn back. So yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna guess cautionary tale overall. Zero Cool asks, why am I not in full support of King Fritz? But then you list the reasons why I'm not in support of King Frist. It's really that he's hiding the truth from the public and all the dirty work that comes with that. That's what it is. He's still doing things wrong. I think when looking at any character, it's to see the things they do that are that are great, that I agree with, and the things that are not so great that maybe I disagree with. And so it's not about like supporting any one or any side outright. It's just like, how do I feel about the individual things? And I think that King Fritz probably had a lot of things right. I think trying to avoid war is a good desire. I think manipulating an entire society of people through coercion and lies is wrong. I think enforcing these lies through killing, you know, killing people who learn the truth is terrible. So I can't support the person. I can't support King Fritz. It's if I ask your rankings of each season. Uh, it's so hard to like separate season three and season four for me. I'm still going to put three as number one, then four, then two, then one. Crimson asks, do you think AOT is worth the hype? Yes, but not initially. I really think it's season three and four that make it for me. Unknown asks, how do I feel about the problematic or fascist themes of the show? And then there's some information about like connections to actual fascist historical figures. I can only speak as somebody who, who doesn't know the facts of this and just has watched the show. And I don't think the show is supporting fascism. If anything, it seems to me to be a critique of fascism. The villainous elements seem to be the fascist elements. Maybe there's similarities there to historical figures, but just from my lens and my priority, I'm I'm not getting that out of it and I'm not taking that from it and so it just sort of is what it is I guess. Wraith asks, what do you think Aaron's intentions are by seemingly supporting Zeke's plan? I am I'm pretty convinced at this point that he doesn't support Zeke and is using him as a tool. The euthanasia thing seems to be against a lot of what Aaron has said and also it's been pointed out to me that I, and I agree that Aaron wouldn't be like calling Zeke brother. It just seems like manipulation. It seems like a, a ploy. I'm not exactly sure what he wants. I mean my best guess is just access to Zeke's powers, the Beast Titan's powers, which would be Pretty, pretty great for him. Blah, blah, blah asks, if you want to revive one of the dead characters, which one would you choose? Maybe Marco. I feel like that would solve a lot of problems. Manasa asks, whose backstory made you feel most for the character? I will say there've been a, a bunch of Levi moments that made me really feel for him. One was the OVA, no regrets. And also it's it's haunting me. It's haunted me ever since I saw the episode where he finds Petra's body because it wasn't immediately obvious to me how much that affected him. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized how much that hit him. That's not exactly backstory, but it just plays into a larger thing with Levi where he's just this like sensitive guy who has an outwardly cold exterior who just keeps getting punished. You know, he keeps experiencing all this tragedy, yet he still keeps moving forward. Yet he gives his life in service. You know, I don't know. I love that. Sora Monroe asks, did the questions you had unanswered from your first watch all those years ago get answered finally? Yeah. 
As many of you know, I stopped watching initially because I thought it would just be a bunch of mystery boxes with no answers. And I'm satisfied. You know, I'm not totally convinced that the author didn't wing some of it as time went on, but it doesn't matter because it worked out and the answers for me are, are satisfying for the most part. I think maybe there was like a little bit more intrigue about it than was necessary. Like it ended up being pretty straightforward when you think about it, but it's like, okay, this is an explanation. And then that explanation can be used to do interesting things, which is exactly what season four was. Korn asks, will you wait for the anime to resume or will you read the manga? I'm generally not really much of a manga person. And also I think that it wouldn't really work as well to do reaction videos to the manga. So I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna wait and just avoid all social media for the next six months, except for, you know, my YouTube. All right, I'm gonna have to call it there because I've been talking about Attack on Titan now for several hours. I apologize if I didn't get to your question. Thank you for all the really, really amazing questions. Thank you for all the amazing comments this whole time. Like, this has been such a spectacular experience for me. As always, or maybe especially so, I feel like I've learned so much from being able to discuss the show every day. And that is really because of the, the discussions and the comments. So thank you so much. Thank you for all the kindness. Thank you for all the, the jokes. Thank you for making me do America's Kill with uh, all these characters. The list goes on. Gratitude continues. It's not as sad this time, you know, to end the show just because we got more coming up, which I'm very excited for. And it's not that far out. So I think what will happen is when it picks up again, hopefully in the winter, like I've heard, I'm going to just stop what I'm doing every time a new episode comes out and react to it. So that will happen. And we'll see where the show goes. And Maybe I can come back to this later and see how many of my predictions were correct since the show's still going. But yeah, that's it for the Attack on Titan videos for now, although maybe I'll do Attack on Titan in nine minutes. So yeah, I'll see you very soon for Invincible, continuing My Hero Academia, and then probably some pilot shows. So see you very soon.